All right, we are live. Hey, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with another live video chat for Friday, October the 25th. And the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here, having a conversation with you for the next hour or so, answering any questions that you may have about building muscle, losing fat, getting in shape, any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to your workouts or your nutrition program, feel free to post those questions, comments, and topics of discussion in our video chat window, and I'll do my best that I can to help you out over the course of our video chat today. So before we go any further, I just want to do a couple little checks. First, I want to make sure that you can actually hear me, see me. Is this coming through loud and clear? Is the microphone coming through? Like, test, test, test. One, two, three. Is it coming through? Hello? <laughs> Uh, can you see me? Is it right? If you can see me uh, waving my arms around, if you can hear me, please type into the video chat and let me know. I would greatly appreciate that. All right, let me just get a couple things organized on my end. Loud and clear. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Good stuff. All right. Just get a. All good. All right. I'm just getting the cords here manipulate it out of the way so I'm not tangling myself up in these cords. All right. Cool. There. Awesome. All right. There we are. Awesome. Okay, guys. Uh, just a, a quick little uh, touch base on something here now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to address in today's video chat, uh, the topic of reducing the friction between you and achieving the goals that you want, between achieving uh, you know, the workout goals you have, the nutrition goals that you have, do, doing what you can to reduce the friction. And this is uh, something, I'm gonna give a shout out to this book here, Atomic Habits. This is something that I've been reading and really diving into. It's, it's by James Clear and this book is phenomenal. I would highly recommend it to everyone who is interested in improving their health and fitness and nutrition habits. And of course, uh, habits throughout other areas of your life as well. But he uses examples with regards to health and fitness a lot throughout this book. But this is, is phenomenal. And I'm going through it because it helps me to coach my one-on-one -on -one coaching students. Because one of the biggest issues that a lot of people have, it's not you know, knowing what to do. Like everybody knows you should eat right. Everyone knows you should exercise. Everyone knows, you know, you should get eight hours of sleep and drink plenty of water and all these healthy habits that are going to move you in the right direction towards reaching your fitness and fat loss and muscle building goals. Like everybody knows that stuff, but so few people actually follow through and do it. And it all comes down to how you structure your lifestyle and the little tiny habits and little decisions that you make in the moment. A lot of it is done on the subconscious level, and that's what the book Atomic Habits really goes into. And one of the things is reducing the friction and making it as easy as possible to stick with your habits. And I'm going to share an example. This is something that just happened within the last week. And in my case, like I'm pretty motivated to work out and get in shape at this stage of the game. Uh, I have been through slumps. You know, I have been through ups and downs. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But over the past couple of years, um, well, past 18 months, I've been very consistent with my workouts and my nutrition, sticking to the plan 80 to 90 percent of the time. And I've shared my progress pictures. Like if you follow me on Facebook and, and social media, you've seen I've been sharing a lot of my progress pictures. Uh, if you want, you can head on over to my uh, my website, muscleafter40blueprint.com, and you can see the, the transformation that I've made. And basically what happened is after my son was born, after Harvey was born in 2016, and, and even leading up until then, like I had kind of let myself get off the bandwagon and I really fell off track. And it's not that I didn't know what to do. It's just I wasn't applying myself and doing what I knew. And, you know, it's, it's easy to have momentum carry you forward or momentum can carry you, you know, in a negative spiral downward. And I was using it in a, in a bad way, right? Like, yes, I knew I should exercise regularly, but I'm like, ah, I'm tired. You know, we got a new baby at home. I'm not getting a good night's sleep. I'll go to the gym tomorrow. And then of course, tomorrow would turn into next week. And, you know, 
when it comes to the nutrition, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not really in the mood to cook. Let's just order a pizza or let's just, you know, get some takeout or whatever. And it just kind of spiraled. These little tiny in the moment decisions, right? You know, they can move you in the right direction or they can carry you in the wrong direction. And in the moment, like one bad decision isn't going to make or break your progress. Just like one good decision isn't going to make or break your progress. Like if you go to the gym today, guess what? You're still overweight and out of shape. Right? You still look the same, even though you just went to the gym. If you, for lunch, choose to have a hamburger and French fries and a milkshake, or you choose to have a chicken salad and a bottle of water, like at the end of that meal, you still look the same, right? Like whether you had a good meal or a bad meal, like you, you don't see the difference right away. And that's why it can be so tempting or, or, or I guess, in the moment, to make a, a bad decision because you know in that one small moment it's not going to mean anything right but it's those decisions that stack up day after day after day that determines wh what direction you go and whether you're moving in the right direction of your goals or you're falling down and, and you're moving in the wrong direction so th these little tiny decisions and this book really clarifies it so again atomic habits by james clear I'm, I'm not sponsored by him or anything like that i haven't even met the guy but i just genuinely love the book that's why i'm giving it an honest review if you want to check it out go ahead i don't get paid for it i'm just an honest recommendation um but i've been really studying that and trying to apply it in my own life and helping not only with myself, but my personal coaching students and also helping, you know, friends and family. And the story that I want to share with you is my wife, Patricia, she hasn't been following along with her workouts as consistently as she should. I mean, you know, she's a full time mommy and having a, you know, the baby at home, you know, it's it's it's. It's tough. I mean, if, if you're parents, you know exactly what I'm going through, right? What we're, what we're going through. I mean, you know the, the challenges of, of raising a family and that. And it's tough. So one of the things we've done is we have Harvey in daycare now three days a week. In fact, that's just where I came from before this video chat. I took Harvey. To, we, we picked him up from daycare. But uh, we have him there three times a week. And we had him in a daycare that is... You know, not not too far from the house, but I mean, it's 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 up the road, but it's in the opposite direction of the gym. And the the goal that we initially had is, we said, okay, on the days that he's in daycare, we're going to go to the gym and work out as a couple. So my wife Patricia would have those three days a week when Harvey's in daycare that she would be able to go to the gym and work out. It didn't always work out that way because we'd drop him off to daycare and then we'd have to come back, you know, drive right past our house again. And very often what would happen is we would, you know, drop them off at daycare, come back to the house, and then she'd probably get busy doing some chores and errands and whatever else was on the agenda. And she'd never get around to actually going to the gym. Now, in my case, I'd say, look, I'm going to the gym with or without you. So I'd pack up my gym bag and go on by myself or I'd work out, you know, whatever. But I'd do it on my own. But in her case, that little bit of friction, right, would, would stop her from going to the gym. So... Just recently, a brand new daycare opened up right next door to the gym that we train at. So Platinum Fitness and CBS Newfoundland, right next door, there's a daycare. It's called Exploring Awaits, brand new daycare. So we actually switched daycares just because it's next door to the gym. Now, literally three days a week, twice a day, actually, because you have to drop them off and pick them up in the afternoon. But we usually only go to the gym once a day. But three days a week, guaranteed, we are there next door to the gym so there's no excuse anymore like we drop harvey off at daycare we walk next door go into the gym and do a workout together and that's what we've been doing over the past week and that is now our new habit because it's automatic like we were taking them to daycare anyway but we were taking them to one across town now we're taking them to one that's literally next door to the gym so look for little opportunities like that in your own life and in your own schedule where you can piggyback and stack habits. Like we have to take them to daycare, but we didn't have to go to the gym. Now daycare is literally at the gym or next door to the gym. So it just reduces that friction that little bit and it makes it that much easier to follow through. So little decisions. I mean, you can do this when it comes to making nutrition choices, when it comes to exercise choices, different lifestyle choices. This is something that you have to look for. Now, of course, I know not everybody has a kid in daycare. And of course, you're not going to have a daycare that might be right next to the gym. But I'm just sharing an example from our own life that we've made a conscious change because we wanted to change our environment to make it easier 
for my wife, Patricia, to work out on a regular basis. So if you're struggling with your workouts, look at how you can manipulate things like this within your own schedule. Uh, another prime example, one of my personal coaching students who I just started working with recently, uh, his name is Aaron. Uh, he has a gym available at his workplace that he was not using. Like it's there, it was so obvious, but he wasn't using it. And, you know, he instead he'd say, like, I'm, I'm too busy or I'm too stressed at work or whatever. I just want to take a break. You know, on my lunch break, I don't want to go work out. Right. And he'd make up all these excuses saying, well, you know, I, I only got an hour long lunch. Like, I've got to eat. How am I going to get a workout in and, and everything else in, in an hour long lunch break? And so he was making all kinds of excuses of why he shouldn't use the gym at work. And instead, he'd say, well, I'll work out when I get home after work. And of course, by the time after work rolls around, he was too, was too tired. He didn't want to go to the gym afterwards. So he got into a negative spiral of not working out. Instead, I set him up with a program, a short, simple lunch hour program, something that he can do very quickly and efficiently. But still, that's five days a week now that he could be going into that gym and doing a little workout, getting it done, actually making progress versus thinking that he has to do this big grand two hour workout that he'd never be able to squeeze into his lunch break and not using it at all. So just changing little things, these little decisions that we make in the moment and taking advantage of things that are in your environment, right? So I mean, that's, that's just another example, but bottom line, that's what you have to do if you wanna make progress, right? You have to look for ways to optimize your habits and lifestyles and these little in the moment decisions. It's not the grand things. Like a lot of people think, oh, I need some big complex workout program, or I need to know the perfect diet with the best macros and calories and blah, 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 blah. No, it's the little in the moment decisions that are going to make or break your progress, right? Whether you decide to go out drinking with your buddies on a Friday night, or you decide that you're going to, uh, you know, go to the gym instead. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to go to the gym on a Friday night, but <laughs> it's, it's just one example, right? That little habit, right? Are you going to go out drinking or are you going to go to the gym, right? Are you going to choose pizza or are you going to choose, you know, a, a chicken salad, right? Like little things like that. These little in the moment decisions stack up over time. I'm not saying they have to be perfect all the time, but if you're perfect or at least making good decisions most of the time, then those good decisions add up over the long term. Anyway, that's the story I want to share with you right there. So let us move in now. We've got a lot of people joining us, which is great to see. So, uh, First Revenge, Jerseys, uh, Midigan, Rafa, Jesse, Adam, Tyler, uh, Hoysan. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, who else is there? Let's see. We got some questions coming through. Tyler's asking, Lee, have you ever done uh, the Wendler 531 program? What are your thoughts? I've I've heard of that program, but I've personally never followed it myself. So I really don't have any specific comments uh, other than um, if, if you're looking for powerlifting training. Jim Wendler knows his stuff, the whole elite fitness team, you know, the whole West Side Barbell. I mean, like I was a huge fan of, of that for, for years. Like I have all the uh, the West Side Barbell VHS tapes. Uh, I followed a lot of Dave Tate stuff. I have a lot of Dave Tate's uh, programs and seminar videos and stuff like that. I even had the opportunity to meet him a few years back in Columbus, Ohio. So I'm a huge fan of, of that whole style of training. But at the stage I'm at now, I'm not interested in powerlifting. Not, uh, let, let me rephrase that. I'm still interested in it. I love it as a sport, but I'm not actively participating in it. So, I mean, I'm not doing powerlifting programs. No, I'm focusing more on just general health and fitness, more bodybuilding related type of programs, not necessarily strength and power programs. And that's just my personal choice because that's what I want to focus on at this stage of the game. But from a powerlifting point of view, definitely I would uh, recommend those type of programs. I've gotten that's that's what I used to do when I was competing in powerlifting, like following the West Side and uh, you know elite FTS programs, and they definitely do work. The guys they know their shit when it comes to powerlifting. Uh, Hoy Sands joining us. He says I have a question about the half squat versus a full squat. Which is better? Both. <laughs> they're they're. Uh, instead of thinking which is better, think of them as two totally different exercises because there's advantages to doing a full ass to the grass squat. And there's also advantages to doing a, a partial squat. There's also advantages to doing uh, squat lockouts in the power rack. 
right? You look at the different ranges of motion as different exercises, even though it technically still is a squat, you work uh, the muscles differently. You're working on uh, different aspects of strength. Like if you're doing a partial squat or a power rack lockout squat and you're handling more weight, then you're overloading different aspects of the exercise. You're helping to strengthen your uh, body's ability to handle more weight, right? Like you're loading up your, your back and, and getting used to the feel of heavy weight on you. Whereas if you're doing full squats, yes, you're working through a full range of motion and getting more time under tension because of the greater range of motion. But due to the nature of the exercise, you have to lift less weight. So th there's advantages to both. Um, generally, I, I, if, like, if I'm doing a leg workout more often than not, I will choose to do full squats. But then there are times when I will do power rack lockouts or I will do partial squats or I'll do different box squat variations with a shorter range of motion and work on that. So again, it's not one is better or worse or anything like that. They're, they're different exercises and it really depends on what it is that you're training for. Uh, like for people who are doing powerlifting, using heavy partial range of motion exercises is beneficial because it helps to strengthen your joints, tendons, and connective tissue to handle heavier weight. And then with proper training, you can actually use that to help make you stronger in the full range of ex full range of motion exercises as well. Okay, what else we got? AJP17 says, I stopped lifting for a year. Should I begin with a bulk diet? <laughs> well, I really don't know what your goal is. I don't know what your, your physical shape or conditioning or, or whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you should bulk or not. But I will say this. Bulking is, is overrated for most people because more often than not, when people say they're bulking, it's an excuse to get fat and it's just a way to justify being fat. And I'm speaking from experience because I've been there like in, in my throughout my competitive bodybuilding years, like usually I would compete once a year because here in Newfoundland, we have our provincial championships, which is once a year. Sometimes, like we did have some years where we had multiple shows, or sometimes I would go away and compete at the Atlantics, which is a regional show, like the Atlantic Canadian Championships. But more often than not, I would compete once per year. So I would diet down and get ready for the show, get ripped for the show. After that was overwards, I would just go back to eating all kinds of crap and junk, and I would justify it by saying I'm bulking, off season bulking. But it really was just an excuse for me to be able to eat pizza and burgers and fries and crap and all that and then gain all that weight. And then when people say, you know, what the hell happened to you? Did you, you piled on so much weight? I'm, oh, I'm off season bulking. That's what I would say. Really, it was just an excuse to let myself get fat because you don't need to get fat to build muscle. Like a lot of people think that you have to get fat to build muscle or you have to be in this massive calorie surplus. No, you don't. Like the amount of a calorie surplus that you need to actually grow new muscle tissue is so small. Like if, if you're eating an extra couple hundred calories a day, that's over your maintenance. Like that's enough to build muscle. Seriously. Like you don't need to be in this like, oh, I, I got to go dirty bulking, right? I got to have pizza and burgers and fries and be in, you know, a 2000 calorie surplus in order to build muscle. No, that's just going to go right to the gut. You're going to just pile on sloppy fat with that kind of diet. You can build muscle with a very slight calorie surplus. In fact, what I recommend when, when people come to me for help and for nutrition advice, I say, treat your bulking diet like you would a fat loss diet. The only difference is we're going to bump up the portions ever so slightly so that now you're in a very slight calorie surplus, but you're still eating clean, healthy foods. You're still, you know, you, you don't use it as an excuse to go pound back junk, which is what most people do when they bulk, right? And I mean, that's... Eat clean, eat lean, and just have a very slight surplus, or maybe even less just maintenance. Like, because I mean, you can still build muscle on a maintenance diet, you know, build muscle and burn fat simultaneously. But, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a fan of, of, of bulking, right? I, the only time, you know, true bulking is even practical or is, is when you have someone who is truly underweight. Like, you know, the, the stereotypical 98 pound weakling who's like desperately tries to trying to put some meat on their bones, you know, in a situation like that, yeah, okay, maybe eating some not so clean foods can help you to get the calories you need to fill up your frame. But for like 90% of the guys out there, you don't need to go on some, you know, bulking diet, just eating clean, being consistent with your workouts, consistent with the nutrition, 
folks not filling up on the good quality foods, that, that's going to be enough to build muscle. But anyway, back to your question. You stop lifting for a year. Focus on just getting your ass back to the gym. Start off with a basic total body workout three days a week. Just start off with the consistency. Like, don't make it overly complicated. I, this, I know I'm kind of going on a rant here, but it's, it's, it's important because a lot of people get stuck in the whole paralysis by analysis. Like, they want to have everything planned out in advance and know exactly what they're going to do and have the perfectly planned program before they even start it. Like, that does not exist. Like, uh, don't even worry about whether you're going to bulk or cut or what kind of training split you follow or anything like that until you're actually going to the gym. Like so many people will spend hours on the internet watching YouTube videos and reading blogs and reading articles and reading studies and getting all caught up in the science and they're not even going to the gym. Like all the science in the world on PubMed does jack shit for your physique. Going to the gym and just showing up and actually doing some exercise will do 10 times more for your physique than reading every study on PubMed, <laughs> right? So like focus on the application, not on you know, getting caught up in, in the, in the details and watching videos and articles and blah, blah, blah. Like you can only optimize something that you're actually doing. If you're not even doing anything, trying to optimize nothing is, is pointless, right? Trying to optimize the workout that you're not doing, like, why, do you, why even bother? I would rather you just go to the gym and just do three sets of 10 of a, of, a, of a basic machine circuit, you know, chest press, row, pull down, shoulder press, leg press, you know, some abdominal work. Boom. If you just did three sets of 10 of those exercises and you did that consistently, that would move you in the right direction. Like, you don't need to overcomplicate it. Just start off with the basics and get some momentum going. After you've been doing that for a while, then we can worry about optimizing it. Then we can start worrying about your nutrition and then, you know, manipulating the different variables. But I mean, if, if you're not doing anything, you can't optimize nothing, right? Like it's pointless. Anyway, let's move on. I know we got a bunch of other questions coming through. Uh, First Revenge is asking, can I build a good grip just doing double overhand deadlifts? You're going to build your grip strength just working out, period. Anytime you grab a barbell, a dumbbell, a machine handle, a pull-up bar, anything, you're working your grip. So, yeah, you can build a good grip by doing uh, that. But I would still recommend specific grip training if you want to maximize your grip strength, right? Deadlifts this is my, my theory on that. Like if, if you're just going to be doing double overhand deadlifts, which no doubt that's going to work your grip, but you're, you're going to be shortchanging your deadlifts because chances are you can deadlift more than you can hold on to, or at least you will, the more advanced you get. Like, again, I don't know how advanced you are in your training, but like um, a typical power lifter or an experienced bodybuilder is going to be able to lift more in the deadlift than they can hold on to with a regular double overhand grip. That's why you see guys using mixed grips. Some guys like to use a hook grip. Uh, some, you know, more often than not, especially bodybuilders, you'll see them using lifting straps when they need to, you know, push the limits for big heavy exercises like deadlifts. So I'm still a fan of that. I mean, I would definitely incorporate, you know, alternate grips or straps or whatever. I mean, the hook grip, I've tried it. I'm not a fan of the hook grip. But I mean, hey, if, if for those guys who can do the hook grip, I, you know, I tip my hat to you, you know, kudos to you. But personally, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I'd rather just use lifting straps <laughs> right? or, or mixed grip. But anyway, um, what I'm getting at here is use the double overhand grip for your deadlifts during your progressively heavier warm up sets. But once you get to the point where your grip is now a limiting factor. Like, feel free to add straps or mixed grip or whatever to maximize your deadlift. And then if you want to do some extra grip work, then do it afterwards, whether it's, it's extra hand grip work, whether that's extra farmer's walk, carries, um, what, whatever different grip exercises you like to do. But, I mean, don't just think of the deadlifts as, as a grip exercise. I mean, it's, it's so much more than that. All right, what else? We've got Roshan joining us. Adam is joining us. Uh, Adam's asking, when following a well-balanced diet, what should I limit my daily sugar intake to? I don't really count the grams, but just avoid obvious sources of sugar. And when I say sugar, I'm talking about processed 
garbage sugar, like the sugar that's in soda pop, the sugar that you would physically add. Like I, I see people like adding sugar to their coffee and tea and sprinkling it over their cereal. And I mean, like, man, like, don't add sugar to your diet, please. Just, just don't. <laughs> like, you don't need sugar. Uh, but if you, the sugar you get should come from natural sources, the sugar that's found in fruits and vegetables, you know, that's the type of sugars that's okay. I mean, natural sugars, if you're getting it from natural unprocessed sources like that, it's, it's totally fine. But I, I would avoid all, you know, outside sources as, as much as possible. I mean, now every now and then if you're eating some processed food, like for example, if you're having a slice of bread, you know, there's probably a couple grams of sugar in the slice of bread. I mean, yeah, you're, you're going to get some trace amounts of sugar that way, you know, and maybe in some of your protein supplements, there might be, a, you know, a couple grams of sugar in a scoop of uh, protein, right? That's fine, you know, because it's it's small, but just don't go out of your way to add sugar to your diet, like you see the average person doing, you know, sugar in their drinks, drinking sugar, like drinking Gatorade and sports drinks like that. That's one that I would recommend to everybody. If, if you're drinking Gatorade, Powerade, or any of these aid sugar water drinks, and you think, oh, I'm doing it because I'm working out and I need the electrolytes and all that, man, it's sugar water. Like, it's just driving your insulin up. It's just going, it's causing body fat gains. Like, do not drink the sugar water. Do not drink regular soda. You know, all that kind of crap. That's, it's just empty garbage calories. Like, if you want to you know, get electrolytes, use salt, use actual sodium, right? Like, or potassium and magnesium, like go for the real thing. Don't go drinking sugar water to try and justify and say, oh, I'm getting my electrolytes. I, I would rather you literally pour some salt on a, on a spoon or, or rip open a little salt packet and get your electrolytes that way than drinking a bottle of Gatorade sugar water and a little with sugar and sodium added in there. So bottom line, just, just limit all obvious sources of sugar. Uh, Rena, Rena Roy is joining us. Uh, position is the best for huge calves. Wide position is more effective or not. Honestly, what feels the, the best for you? Don't go get to, like, do not get too hung up on, oh, should I have my feet wide, narrow, in, out, whatever, like, when I'm doing calf raises, I usually just use a neutral foot position, like feet, shoulder width apart, sometimes even maybe a little bit narrower. Toes usually are, are just straight ahead. I mean, sometimes they may angle a little bit, but it's just what feels comfortable. Like, don't exaggerate uh, the calf raise. Like, just, just take a neutral foot position and focus on that. Now, once you're doing that consistently and, you know, you feel like, okay, you're maxing out. And, and you're obviously consistent with doing that. Then if you want to try some different foot positions, it's okay. But get the consistency with the basics first. Like if, if you're just getting started, don't overcomplicate things and think, well, I need to try different foot positions or this and that. Like just stick to the basics. Stick to it. Just a natural, comfortable, neutral foot position. Use that. Then if you find that you're hitting a plateau like after several weeks or several months or even several years and you want to try and mix it up, then, then you can experiment with it. But in my case, I still stick to the just a neutral foot position when I do calves. I mean, I've been training for, started in 1990. So here we are, 2019. So here we go. We're going on 29 years of working out, and I still just use a natural neutral foot position. I find it's kind of pointless for me. Like, I don't get any extra benefit if I point my toes out or if I narrow them in. Like, it doesn't make any difference. I just find neutral foot position, we feet shoulder width apart, it works the best for me. So you got to find what works the best for you. Frederick is joining us and he's asking, how do you incorporate pull-ups every day without overtraining? And what about the biceps, forearms, etc.? I know that you did that in your early days of your journey. Simple. You just do like literally one. This is how I would do it. I would do one set of pull-ups every morning. That was it. One set. Uh, and... Like that, that one set of pull-ups, yes, I would still be working the muscles, but it's not, it's such a small volume of exercise that your body can recover from it. So like uh, normally I would do my weight training, my, my full weight training workout would be in the afternoon. So before work or before school or whatever, when I was in my early days, I would do one set of pull-ups because I wanted to get better at pull-ups. I sucked at pull-ups. 
So I would do one set each morning and then I go on about the rest of my day. And then later on that afternoon, I would do my weight training workout. Well, by later on that afternoon, like I was fully rested and recovered from that one set of pull-ups. Like it, it, if you just do that one set, it's not enough volume to make you break down the muscles. Now, I mean, for a beginner, it probably is, but if you have a decent level of conditioning and work capacity, you can easily handle a set of an exercise on a daily basis and recover from it. So that's all I would do with just one set, but look at it over the big picture, like one set of pull-ups done every day for a year that adds up. Like even if you skip a few days, but let's say you get 300 days a year, you get that's that's 300 sets of pull-ups over the course of the year that you normally would not get. And I mean, if you look at it over the big scope of things like that, that can add a lot of extra volume of training, a lot of extra muscle stimulation and make you a lot better when you look at it. But it's done in such a small, manageable amount that it doesn't break your body down to the point that you can't recover and handle it. So that's how I managed to do it and make progress and it worked really well for me. Now it's just one of my favorite exercises and I'm, I'm still not the best at it, but I mean, you know, I can rep out pull-ups in the double digits with good form, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, what else we got here? Uh, okay, a lot of questions about the calf raises. This is from, uh, Rina, Rina, I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing your name. Rina, I think it is. But again, just use a neutral foot position with your calf raises. Don't overthink it. Like, just go to the gym and do your calf raises however they feel comfortable. Like, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. The only thing I'm going to emphasize when it comes to calf raises is make sure you use a full stretch and a full peak contraction with each repetition. Emphasize the range of motion because when it comes to calf raises, the calves are a very tough, dense muscle group, and they're always being used in the mid-range. Every time you, you walk, you take a step, you move, you're, you're doing like a little mini calf raise, but it's always in that mid-range. You're never fully letting your heel sink all the way down for a full stretch in the bottom, and you're very rarely getting all the way up on your tippy toes for a full peak contraction at the top. So those are the positions that you want to emphasize when you're doing calf raises if you want to maximize muscle growth. Focus on the fully stretched position, and the fully peak contracted position. You do that with each repetition and, and be it consistent, you're gonna see progress. Like don't go getting hung up, oh, should my feet be six inches wide, nine inches wide, 12 inches wide? Like, like who gives a shit how wide your feet are? It's, it's, it's the calf, it's the motion of the calf, not the width of your feet. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, Pinkish Jane is joining us and saying, I'm struggling with consistency. I know what's good and what's bad, but I don't know why I'm not able to do it. Can I become more accountable? How can I, sorry, how can I become more accountable and achieve fitness goals and transform? Read this book. This book will definitely help with that for sure. And if you would like some help, you know, you, you would like to discuss this, feel free to send me a, an email, leeh at leehayward.com. And we can chat about it because this is something that I really emphasize with my personal coaching students. 99% of the people that come to me for fitness advice, it's not because they don't know what to do. Like everyone watching this, I'm sure if I asked you, hmm, do you think you should exercise on a regular basis? I don't think people are like, I don't know. I don't know about that. Mm, I don't think so. No, maybe not. You know, do you think like chocolate cake is, is healthier than fruits and vegetables? I don't know. Maybe maybe the chocolate cake is healthier. I'm not sure, right? Like, you know the basics. You know exercise is better than no exercise. You know natural unprocessed foods is better than junk foods. Like, everybody knows the basics. They know enough to get themselves moving in the right direction. But it's just they don't do what they know. <laughs> so more often than not, when I'm coaching people, I'm helping them do what they already know to get them started. Now, of course, once you start making progress and you're in beyond that initial beginner phase and you're starting to move into more of the intermediate phase and your body starts hitting plateaus and now you need to actually focus on more advanced training and nutrition strategies, that's different. But most people who are overweight and out of shape, it's not because they don't know enough. It's they're not doing what they already know. So you, you need to change your lifestyle, your habits, and, and this can having a coach guide you can really help with this. Right? It's it's 
there's so much that can be done within your your lifestyle, within your environment, within your your mental programming, changing your 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 identity and your self image. Like there's so much. Like getting in shape is not you know exercises, sets, reps, protein, carbs, fat, and macros and calories. Like it, it it's 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 all a mental game. It really is. It's a, it's a mental game. If you can master the mental game, you can master the physical game. But that's where most people screw up is. They know all this stuff, or at least they know enough to get moving in the right direction, but just they just don't do what they know. All right, we have Woodyalos joining us. Good evening from a chilly Scotland. He says, I bet it's cold there in Newfoundland. Actually, it's it's nice here today. I mean, of course, it's still fall, but we're, I don't know, it was, it was somewhere around 10 degrees Celsius today. So it's, yes, it's chilly, but it, it's it's nice. It's still comfortable. There's no snow on the ground yet, so I mean, hey, we're doing good. Uh, Frederick's joining us. He says, "Lee, what is a lunch break program?" EKS. EKS. I don't even know. I there's so many acronyms. I don't even know what an EKS is. I'm gonna do a search. I know it's probably gonna be something like so obvious, but I don't know what an EKS is. What is an EKS? An Amazon Elastic? Uh, no, I don't think that's what you're asking. <laughs> if, if somebody knows what EKS stands for, type it into the chat window. What does EKS stand for? I'm getting some Amazon Elastic Kubernetes. I have no idea what the hell that is. And I'm, anyway, I'm going to skip this and move on very soon. Again, I, I'm getting some uh, Amazon Elastic something or another. So what is a lunch break program? EKS. Um, I'm going to have this uh, sorry, Frederick, um, if, you, if you're watching this, I mean, if you want to type in, a, 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 you know, expand on your question in the, in the chat, please feel free to do so. But I'm going to just move on now because I don't know what an EKS is. All right. Rena still posting questions about the calves. Look, dude, just just relax. Like, you know, your, your calves are going to grow. Just just train the bloody calves. All right. I'm going to move on. <laughs> Jesse is joining us. He says, I struggled with the program, with program hopping, always going from one to the next hyped up program and not making any progress until the past month. I put together something that suited me and I've been having fun and making progress. Well, good for you, my friend. And, and what you're talking about there is such a common thing, program hopping. And if you don't know what program hopping is, it basically means you go on the YouTube or you go on the Google or, or bodybuilding.com or anything like that, and you see, oh, that's a cool looking program. I think I'll follow that. So you do it for a day or two. And then, you know, then you go on YouTube or Google or bodybuilding.com and you see another program. Oh, that one looks better. I think I'll do that one now. And then you jump to that program for a day or two. And then the next time you go online, you see another program. Oh, like red shiny ball syndrome, right? There, there, there's the red ball. I'm going to keep chasing the red ball. Like, you need to stick to one program long enough for it to actually work for you. Jumping from program to program, you know, is, is not helping. Now, now, with that being said, jumping from one program to, to another, if, if you're still doing that consistently and you're still showing up to the gym on a regular basis, that's better than not doing anything at all. So, you know, there, there's, it's not like right or wrong, good or bad. It's, it's like, it's, it's good, better, best, right? There, there's ranges. So, I mean, if, if you show up to the gym at all, that's good. If you have a structured program, that's better, right? If you optimize that program and you, you know, you can manipulate it to, you know, just change it. So when you hit a plateau that you're adjusting the variables, that's best. But in the case of Jesse program hopping, you know, going from one program to the next, it's, it's a big problem. And the problem is because we have so much information, like, you know, I'm, you, you're following me or obviously you're probably following other YouTubers and your other social media fitness influencers and all that. And everybody's saying something different. And then you end up just jumping from program to program. Whereas you kind of have, have this stubbornness, this, this just 
one track mind to say like, this is the program I'm going to follow. I'm going to stick to this until it stops working. And, you know, that could be a month, could be two months, could be three months. I mean, wh however long it is, but follow a s one set path, get some results from it. And then when it finally you realize, okay, my progress is starting to plateau or it's even starting to backtrack, which does happen sometimes. Then you realize, okay, now that program has ran its course. It's time for me to change it up and do something different. But every routine you follow is going to go through adapt, grow, plateau. So you have to follow a program long enough to let your body adapt to it. And if you're always program hopping, you skip that whole process because you never adapt to anything. You're just jumping from one routine to the next, right? Like a just a leaf floating in the wind, right? You're going from all over the place. There's no rhyme or direction to your program. So you need to stick to something long enough to let your body adapt to it. Once it adapts, then you're going to see some growth. You're going to grow in response to that. Eventually, after a while, you're going to hit a plateau. Every program, I don't care how well it's laid out or who designed it or whatever, everything goes through adapt, grow, plateau. Once you hit that plateau and you're doing the same thing over and over again and it's not working anymore, your body's just not responding, that's when you have to have that, you know, the, the knowledge and the and the smarts about you to change it up and realize, okay, now I need to do something that's going to be complementary to what I was doing before and help spur on some new muscle growth and then provide some unique stimulation so that I can get growing again. But um, yeah, that's, that's a common issue these days, program hopping. We have Ken has joined us from over in the UK. I guess it's getting late over there in the UK, but nice to have you. Tyler is joining us. He says, do you use bands or chains when you're training? I used to when I was competing in powerlifting, but now I don't. Just, just straight weight from barbells, dumbbells machine is good enough for me. Um, what else? Brent is joining us. He says, word up, Lee. Brent from, Nar from Navarre, Florida. Uh, do you use creatine? Yes. Do you use any specific supplements? Yes. And what do you recommend for lean muscle growth? <laughs> All right. To answer your questions, Brent. Yes, I do use creatine. I, and creatine, it, it's not a miracle supplement. Like, it's not some magical thing that, you, okay, you take it and you're going to be, you know, go from zero to hero because you take creatine, but it helps, right? It, it does help the process a lot. So it, it's, it's effective not only for building muscle, but it has cognitive benefits. There's health benefits to creatine. So even if you're not working out, like I would recommend creatine just the same as I'd recommend like a, a vitamin supplement because it, there's, there's a lot of health benefits to it. I mean, there's been shown to help with the uh, neurological problems and, and mental issues. Like people who suffer from Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease have been shown to get positive benefits from supplementing with creatine to help improve their mental function. So, I mean, it has that benefit to it as well. So it's not just a muscle building supplement. It actually is a good overall health supplement. So that's why I'm a big fan of creatine. Uh, other ones that I'm a fan of, I, I use digestive enzymes and probiotics to help aid with the digestion because let's face it, I mean, if the food you eat, if you can digest it, absorb it and utilize it to the maximum ability, you're going to get more nutritional benefit from it. So I'm a big fan of uh, digestive enzymes and probiotics. I personally use the ones from Bioptimizers because I find that they're geared towards optimizing protein digestion, which is the hardest of all the macronutrients to digest. It's easier to digest and absorb carbohydrates and fats. It's harder to digest protein, but protein is the building blocks for muscle tissue uh, you know, and all basically all body tissues. So I, I'm a big fan of, of supplementing with those. Uh, what else? Greens powder. Just the same as you take protein powder to supplement your protein intake, you can take greens powder to supplement your veggie intake. Huge fan of greens powder. Uh, I take a whole slew of vitamins and minerals and, and essential fatty acids. So like I'll take uh, a super concentrate high potency fish oil, which is high in omega threes. I take uh, magnesium, zinc, uh, the B vitamins, vitamin D, uh, all those to help ensure that I'm getting, you know, the essential vitamins. Like most people, most vitamin D, you're probably low in magnesium, you're probably low in the B vitamins, you're probably low in zinc, you're probably low in. So like all these key ones that most people are, are, are deficient in, I, I make sure to supplement with those. Uh, when it comes to my supplements, like I don't really look at the quote unquote muscle building supplements. I look at the general health and fitness supplements because I, I'll, I'll be honest, like a lot of the ones that are marketed as muscle builders, 
you know, there, there's more sizzle than steak. Let's just say that, right? I, I'm not going to say they're all worthless because there's a lot of supplements out there and some may be good, right? But but there's a lot of there's a lot of hype in the supplement industry, especially in the bodybuilding supplement industry. So the mo- the most supplements that I use now are for general health and and fitness, not necessarily muscle building products, because I find a lot of the muscle building products are just you know saying more sizzle than steak. All right, Tyler is joining us. Have you winterized the the <laughs> Have you winterized the dory by much love from Peterborough, Ontario? I, I don't got myself a dory. So uh, <laughs> my uncle did, though. I, I've, I have spent time in the dory. I will tell you that I did. When I was a young lad, that's one of the things I used to do. My, my uncle, God rest his soul, he passed away a couple of years ago now. But he, he, he's the one who put the bayman in me, right? He taught me how to fish, taught me how to go out jigging cod. Taught me how to cut wood. Taught me how to ride an ATV in a snowmobile. Like, you know, God rest him. He, he, he taught me how to be a bayman. And uh, he had, he lived right on the water. And he had a, a wharf and uh, an outboard motorboat. He also had an old, uh, old-fashioned three Atlantic putt-putt engine. Like, the old-fashioned engines, the three Atlantic, you'd wind it up. And it go pop, 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 like the thing only like went along at like a snail's pace, but oh, it was nice. We used to go out jigging codfish and, and that, but he'd have that one moored out further. And then right next to the wharf, he'd have his dory. So what we would do is we'd put all our stuff in the dory and we'd row out to the, to the, you know, the three Atlantic putt putt boats that he had moored up outside and uh, put all our fishing gear in it and that and, and go off, you know, fishing. So yeah, so I, I I do have a bit of bame in, in the in the blood for sure, but uh, I haven't I haven't rode a dory in years. But anyway, thanks for joining us, Tyler. And I know everyone else who who's tuning in, they're like, "What the hell is he talking about dories and blah blah blah." Uh, anyway, you got to be a newfie by to understand what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> Steve is joining us. Hey, Steve. He's got a question saying, I don't know if you remember. I emailed you a few months ago. It says, I'm 39. I'm from the UK. I'm in a wheelchair. I was a bodybuilder until about seven years ago. I had a hernia in my chest. Was told that I'd never lift again. I've started resistance. I think his question got cut off. Because he just stopped mid-sentence. I'm going to see if he asks. He started resistance bands. Okay, there was the question. Um. Actually, I don't know if that's a question or a statement, but yes, I do recall you sent me an email, Steve. Yeah. And I'm glad that you started tr- training, but I don't know if there was a, if there was a question or just a statement that you're sharing with me. But the bottom line, man, at least you are taking action. That is the main thing. And, you know, like a lot of people think if they're in a wheelchair or they have a physical disability that, that they can't lift. And that's not the case. You know, I've seen a lot of guys, well, not a lot. I've seen several guys at the gym who have disabilities, like either walking with crutches or in wheelchairs, and they still make the best of their situation. You know, they'll do what machine exercises they can do. Like a lot of the seated exercises and the lying exercises, uh, different cable exercises, they'll still manage to get in a workout despite their limitations. Now, usually you got to have somebody to help you. But what I found from personal experience, is if you show up with eagerness, you'll find people to help you. Like most most people who go to the gym are are very accommodating and friendly, at least around here. I mean, I I can't speak for everywhere in the world because I haven't been everywhere in the world, but I know for most of the time when I see people going to the gym and they need help, most of the other gym members are willing to lend a helping hand. And that's what I would often find when I see people like sometimes, you know, handicapped or disabled people coming into the gym you know people will be there hey you you want me to go grab you a set of dumbbells you want me to help you you know get set up on that machine or something like that they'd be more than willing to help the guy out and um, it's nice to see and in fact one of the strongest uh, bench pressers that I've ever known was a paraplegic he used to walk with crutches and um, you know man his name was Kenny I remember he's a local guy one of the strongest pound for pound power lifter bench pressers that I ever seen. And man, he could throw up some weight. I think like somewhere in the vicinity, like a triple body weight bench press. 
I, I, I not exactly sure on the numbers, but it was somewhere in that range, like just off the charts strong. Yeah. So again, man, the fact that you're in the gym working out, I have a lot of respect for you. Like I say, make the best of your situation. It's probably not going to be perfect, but make the best of the situation. All right. Progress is always possible if you if you approach it with the right attitude. All right, let's see what else we got. Raymond is joining us. We have Al is joining us. Um, Paul, Peter, awesome. All right, so uh, Raymond's got a question here saying, I can't gain weight easily. I've been working out for a couple of years, but still can't bulk up. I have just lean muscles. I've tried eating more, didn't work. What should I do to bulk up? I'm only 62 kg. First off, that is, is a blessing and a curse in one because if, if you are lean you're, you're ahead of the game because i mean look at the average person up there. the average person is not lean so you obviously have a very fast metabolism that is an advantage right you have low body fat and chances are what muscle you do gain will be quality muscle right it's not going to be the the, the the fatty bulked up muscle right where you okay someone puts on 10 pounds of body weight or 10 kilos of body weight and uh, you know 70% of it is just excess fat, right? Chances are, if, if you are a naturally lean person with a fast metabolism, the majority of the weight you gain, even though it's going to be slower, is probably going to be better quality. So that's actually going to be an advantage. But uh, the same thing applies. It's, it's just as challenging for someone who's underweight to gain as it is for someone who's overweight to lose. Now, there's different uh, modalities and, and principles apply. I mean, obviously, you need to be in a calorie surplus where someone who's trying to lose needs to be in a calorie deficit. And, and you need to adjust your workouts like you're not going to work out the same as someone who's overweight and trying to lose weight like you need to adjust things differently um but if, if you'd like some help with this like i know we're kind of running out of time here with with regards to the video chat but if you would like to discuss you know a realistic action plan to help you move in the right direction towards your muscle building goals send me an email and my name my email is lee h at lee hayward.com just drop me a line and i'd be more than happy to have a chat with you all right, Paul's asking, what do you think about uh, corsets that hold your back flat for repairing a rounded back? Some say it's not good because it gets to be a dependency. I think you mean like the, the back braces. I've sometimes seen guys wear those. It's just, where I've noticed it especially is, is people like working in, in stores or warehouses or somewhere like that where they're doing a lot of physical lifting and moving. Sometimes they will wear a back brace all day long. I've, I've kind of got a mixed opinions about that. Like in the short term, if you have like pulled a muscle in your back and that helps you to support it and you're using that as just to kind of overcome like an injury or, or some little strain that you've had recently, it makes sense. But to use it all the time, like thinking, okay, uh, I want to like wearing a weightlifting belt thinking, well, I'm going to wear a weightlifting belt all the time. So I want to protect my back. Well, that's just going to cause your back to get weaker. Like use it when you need it, not use it all the time just for the sake of using it. And, and that applies to a lot of these different uh, tools that we use for support. For example, like in knee wraps, uh, wrist straps, you know, like a lot of people use weightlifting belts, all that. Yes, they have a purpose, but save them for when you need them. Uh, what I usually recommend is do all your progressively heavier warm up sets and all your isolation exercises and things that are not as demanding. Do all those exercises without any artificial support, meaning no weightlifting belts, no knee wraps, no lifting straps or, or anything like that. Just do it with your natural body to build up your, your core strength all around. And then when you get to some max effort lifts, maybe like you're doing a heavy set of deadlifts or you're doing a heavy set of squats or overhead presses, then you can put on like a weightlifting belt, help support your back. Now, in the case of, of what you're talking about, these uh, back supports, if it's for day-to-day -day work, I would still use the same principle there. Like for chances are during your day-to-day -day work, you're not doing like max effort work all day long. But if you are going to do something extra heavy, let's say, you know, transport truck just pulled in and you have to offload that truck into the warehouse. Okay. Well for that, maybe you want to put on the, the back support to do that. But then when you're out doing your day-to-day -day stuff, stocking the shelves or whatever your errands happen to be, don't have the back support on Let your back build up naturally. But when you know you're going to be doing some extra heavy lifting, 
and maybe put it on just the same as someone who's in the gym would wear a weightlifting belt when they're doing a heavy set, but they wouldn't wear it for the entire workout. All right. So let's see. Um, Peter's asking this. He says, Frank Zane said he never used the Greek classic golden ratio rule for measuring certain body parts for a symmetrical body. He said he never measured himself. Do you agree? Uh, I guess. <laughs> right? If Frank says he's never measured himself, who am I to argue? Right? I don't measure myself by any golden ratio rule either. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not hard to believe. <laughs> I don't go by all that you know, hype. <laughs> uh, what else we got there? Tyler saying, what's the difference between knee wraps and knee sleeves? Um, with a knee sleeve, it's, it's typically less support and something that's meant to be worn longer. A knee wrap is usually more support and something that's meant to be worn for a very short term in, in terms of like one set. Like if you watch power lifters wrap their knees, like they wrap those suckers tight, like they're going around and they're like super, super tight and to provide like crazy amounts of support and they do help with your strength. But if, if you kept them on for any length of time, it would cut off circulation to, to your legs because it's so, so ridiculously tight. So they typically would wrap their knees, do a set and then unwrap the knees and let the blood flow and circulation return. Whereas a knee sleeve provides a much less lighter support and it's meant to be worn for like the duration of your workout. So it's, it's, it's both knee support, but one is like super tight, super strict support. And one is just like moderate support that's, that can be worn for a longer period of time. Uh, okay. Flip is a flip or Philip. I think it's Philip actually. <laughs> Philip is joining us. He says, greetings. Do you think going to the gym affects your spine? Uh, I think it did mine. Uh, also, what alternatives do you recommend for the shoulder press? It hurts my lower back when I do shoulder press, even seated. If going to the gym and working out is causing issues with your spine, chances are you probably have some pre-existing spinal issues like scoliosis or something like that, that the workouts could be aggravating. Because most people, I mean, obviously, if you lift too much too soon, you could strain your back. I'm not saying that the injury is not possible or because it certainly is. But, like, I don't have any back pains when I go to the gym. And I find that going to the gym helps to strengthen my back. Um, but if you're finding that it's, it's having an impact, you probably have some pre-existing issues. And the workouts are aggravating those pre-existing issues. It would probably be, if, if I were in your situation, I would go get a checkup from your doctor and just see if you do have any spinal issues. I mean, you could even go to a chiropractor or any back specialist as well to see if you have any you know, pre-existing issues or nerve impingements or anything like that that could be causing some pain. Um, I'm not saying don't go to the gym because very often going to the gym and strengthening all the muscles, joints, tendons, and ligaments is what's going to help you to ultimately build a stronger back. But it would be a be nice to know if you do have any pre-existing issues that you need to be aware of so that you don't cause yourself any further problems or, or aches or pains. So that's what I would do if I were in your situation. I'd get it checked out by a healthcare professional, be that a doctor or a chiropractor or some specialist of some sorts, just to see what's going on there and why you are having back pain. Uh, but uh, to Frederick's asking, how many years did I do the, the pull-ups? Um, I did it consistently through most of my bodybuilding competition days. Now, it, it'd go in phases. Like sometimes I would be really strict on it and I do it like I wouldn't skip a day for, for weeks on end. And then other times I'd kind of get lazy and I you know, wouldn't do it for a month or more. And then I'd say, oh, I should get back into doing those pull-ups again. So it wasn't always consistent, but it's something that I've, I've done periodically throughout the years and like even now like when i'm like down in my basement or something like that like the way it's set up like our basement home gym is set up like right next to where our laundry room is so sometimes if i'm bringing laundry down like i might say hey i'm just going to go throw in and do a set of pull-ups for the hell of it so even now like at four or five days a week i'm, I'm throwing in extra pull-ups and, and little things like that, or I might, you know, just hit the floor and do some push-ups and throw in little extra exercises in addition to the workouts that I do, uh, you know, my, my scheduled workouts. Those are just like little 
extra bonus things that I throw in from time to time. So yeah, it's it's been years that I've been doing that, and I still do it. But it's it's not always consistent. It's not like every single day. It's probably like three four days a week. Uh, Glenn is joining us. He says he has some problem with shoulder press. It feels bad after working out. Um, then what I would suggest is either find a different shoulder press variation or just skip the exercise entirely and work, focus on other exercises to work the shoulders. I mean, you, when it comes to all these different exercises, like if the shoulder press hurts, you don't have to shoulder press. Like you can do other exercises instead. Like you can do like side lateral raises, front raises, uh, isolation work for the rear delts. Like you can still work all the heads of the, del of the deltoids without doing the shoulder press. And you can also find different variations. Like if, if a barbell shoulder press hurts, try using dumbbells. If the dumbbells don't feel right, then try using machines. You can even try using resistance bands or things like that to just see if you can find a variation that works. You know, sometimes you can do it standing or seated or even just change the angle. Like maybe if, if a vertical shoulder press hurts, if you angle the bench slight back, like if you're doing a seated shoulder press, that is. And so instead of a true shoulder press, you're doing like a very high incline press. Maybe that angle will allow you to still work the muscle, do the exercise without pain or discomfort. So it all comes down to just experimenting and finding what positions work the best for you. And, you know, I mean, I, we, we can all do that because, I mean, not every exercise is suited to every body, right? So if you find something that just doesn't feel right for you, try another variation instead. And if, if you still can't find it, then maybe just scrap that exercise and worry about doing other exercises to work the same muscle group. And of course, you could also look into visiting your doctor to see why you have shoulder problems to begin with. I mean, it could be some shoulder impingements, you know, it could be nerve or mobility issues there. I mean, you may need to go to a physiotherapist for that as well. But in the short term, I'm saying like try and just work around it the best you can with your workouts in the gym. So if a particular move doesn't feel right, then don't do it. All right, Kevin is joining us. He's Kevin from Seattle. He says, I wanted to know your preference between bro splits, full body workouts, etc. I'm a fan of it all. I will go through phases of total body workouts. I'll go through phases of body part split routines, push pull legs, upper lower. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any one particular preference. I like them all, and I find that they all have their own time, place, and situation. Like, for example, if somebody is on a very busy schedule and they can't make it to the gym very often, full body workouts are great because then at least every time you go to the gym, you're providing some muscle stimulation for all your major muscle groups. For someone who has uh, a lot more time that they, they I'm getting tongue tied here, a lot more time that they can dedicate to the gym, then maybe breaking it up into a body part split is ideal. So you work different muscle groups on different days. Like, if, if I had six days a week that I could dedicate to going to the gym, I would probably opt for a body part split so that I'm training different areas of the body and not having a lot of overlap because I'm in their gym six days a week. Versus if I can only work out, say, two or three days a week, I'm more opt to choose maybe a full body workout or maybe like an upper lower body split so that I can get more training frequency for the times that I do go to the gym, more training frequency for each of the major muscle groups. So it's not that one is right or wrong. It really depends on the individual and their situation. And so that, that's my opinion on it, right? Like use what works the best for you. Okay. Frederick's asking again about the pull-up routine that I did. Would I train to failure? Mm, not really. Um, I mean, it might be to the point of True failure, and what I mean by true failure is the point at which you can't do another repetition with good form. But it wouldn't be the point that I couldn't physically move or do a pull-up at all. Like If it got to the point where I had to swing and cheat and kind of kick my way up to doing pull-ups, I'd stop the set. But if I could do good quality pull-ups, I would keep doing rep after rep until the point where my form started to break down, and then I stopped the set. And, and that's a rule of thumb I use for my workouts in the gym. Like if I'm doing a set of bicep curls, I don't curl to the point where I physically can't lift the barbell at all. I curl to the point where my form starts to break down. So if I get to where I have to start swinging and cheating, I'm like, okay, that's it. You know, 
the set is done. I, I've, I've hit true failure in terms of my form is breaking down. Same with like I'm doing a set of bench presses. Like I don't wait to the point where I'm stuck to the bench with the barbell stapled to my chest and I'm yelling, help, help. <laughs> I get to the point where I'm starting to struggle. I can feel like, you know, uh, my form isn't very good or smooth at this phase. Then I'll rack the weight and stop the set. Right? I don't get to the point where I'm stapled to the bench or like if I'm doing a set of squats. Once I get to the point where it, my form starts to break down, then I end the set and I rack the weight. I don't wait until I'm stapled to the bottom of a squat in, in the power rack or a squat rack and, you know, can't get up. <laughs> right? Use that as your cue. True failure should be the point where your form breaks down, not the point at which you cannot move the weight at all. And if you stop at that point, you will greatly reduce your risk of injury. Uh, where else? I think I just lost my place with the questions. We got a lot of questions coming through, so I do appreciate the support. This is awesome. And I know we've actually gone over an hour, so I'm actually going to clue it up very shortly. Let's see what else we got here. Um, Anthony's asking, do you ever worry about your cholesterol levels? He says, mine came back high. Um, I would recommend keeping tabs on your cholesterol. Like every time I've gotten blood work done, my cholesterol has either been low or in the normal range. I've never had high cholesterol, even though I regularly eat whole eggs, I regularly eat red meat, and things of that nature, quote unquote, high cholesterol foods. See, the, the cholesterol is a very misunderstood subject because if you don't eat enough dietary cholesterol, your body will produce the cholesterol it needs. Like cholesterol is essential for, for life. It's essential for hormone production. It's essential for so many functions within the body. Like you need cholesterol. That's why your body produces cholesterol, whether you eat it or not. Like if you ate a zero cholesterol diet or as close to a zero cholesterol diet, your body would still produce it because it's so essential for, for life and for, for all the functions we need, you know, from hormonal to, to numerous processes within the body. So Eating dietary cholesterol isn't as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. And it's like if you eat more dietary cholesterol, then that's less cholesterol that your body has to manufacture on its own, right? So it's, it's, it's not always eat less cholesterol and have your cholesterol levels go down. It doesn't work that way, right? Like it, it's a more complex issue. And a lot of times it's due to lifestyle choices. Like if you're eating a lot of unnatural processed foods, that can elevate cholesterol. If you're not getting exercise and you're not getting enough blood flow and circulation throughout your body, then that can help, you know, that can cause cholesterol to build up, right? It's, it's more than just, um, you know, cutting out meat and eggs, right? Like it's, it's not as simple as that. Uh, what else we got? All right. Another question here. This one's elaborating on the whole, question that I had there about the EKS or whatever the heck it was. He just wanted to know a basic workout program that he could do on his lunch break. Uh, the, the, there's nothing really special about a, a lunch break program other than the fact that it has to be short enough that you can get done within your lunch break. So I would usually just do an abbreviated program for people who have to work out on their lunch break. So let's just typically say you have an hour for lunch and Again, you can manipulate this based on your schedule. Like if, if you work in an office situation where you could eat at your desk, like after lunch, right? What I would do is I would maximize that lunch hour for going to the gym and, and working out. And then afterwards, I would bring my, you know, my lunch that I had packed and eat it at my desk while I was doing work after lunch. So technically, I would use the lunch hour for working out and then eat while I'm doing work, if that makes sense. But if you truly have to work out and eat all within your lunch hour, like you physically can't eat at your desk or, or maybe you don't even have a desk job and you're doing physical stuff, uh, then what I would suggest is just do a mini, mini workout, like do like a half an hour workout and then go and have your, your lunch and get go on about your day afterwards. But bottom line, like get out of this all or nothing mentality. Like a lot of people are stuck in if I, if I can't do a two hour workout in the gym, then I'm not going to go to the gym at all. Or if I can't follow a perfect diet plan, then I'm not going to follow any diet plan. They have this all or nothing mentality. Like instead of thinking of, you know, how can I make it just a little bit better? Like, even if I have 10 minutes, like 
I, I can exercise in 10 minutes. Like literally, if, if you just did a set of push-ups, a set of bodyweight squats, you know, did some ab work, maybe a set of pull-ups and just did set for set for set, like in a circuit routine fashion and did that like nonstop for 10 minutes, you would get an amazing workout in 10 minutes, right? You would be huffing and puffing. Your body would be pumped. Like you, you could, you'd be amazed at how much exercise you could get done in 10 minutes if you really wanted to. So a lot of people have this idea that if, if they don't have the time to go to the gym or they can't do this, whatever they consider to be a perfect program in their own mind, then they're not going to do anything at all. And that is a mistake. Like try and find ways to optimize your schedule to the best of your ability. Same with your nutrition. Like a lot of people think, well, if I can't eat a perfect meal, then I'm just going to eat crap. Like, no, it doesn't have to be that way. Like even if you're eating out in a restaurant, you can still make better food choices in a restaurant. Or another a choice that we all have is the volume of food. Even if you have to eat, you know, not so healthy food, you don't have to eat until you're stuffed, right? You can eat smaller portions of the not so healthy food, and that will go a long way into reducing the calories and the damage done. Like there's always there's always a level of choice and decision and control that you have, and if you exercise that control and use it to move yourself in the right direction versus always letting yourself fall into bad habits and fall in the wrong direction, you you can still make progress. So getting back to your question, Frederick, I mean, as far as a lunch break program, it's just a short program that you can do for your lunch break. It's not like there's a special, oh, here is the lunch break workout. No, it's, it's just, can, can you get it done within your lunch break? And if not, then then tr trim it down. Like if, if the, the workout program has three sets of each exercise and, and you don't have time to do it, then let's do two sets of each exercise. Let's just make it shorter so that you can get it done within the allotted amount of time. Or maybe there's certain exercises that you feel, you know, I'm just going to trim off these exercises or maybe I can do them at home later, especially if it's like a body weight thing or something like that. Like sometimes if, um, if, if you have a set of dumbbells at home, like, and there's a dumbbell exercises within your workout and you don't have time to do them at the gym, and I say, well, hey, later on that evening when you get home, then you can do those dumbbell exercises afterwards, right, to make up for it. Anyway, how are we doing? Oh, sugar, look at the time. All right, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. So, again, thank you so much for uh, tuning in, guys. I really appreciate the support. And, again, we've had a lot of good questions come through. So, as always, what's going to happen now is the replay of this is going to be posted up very shortly. But I'm going to get the timestamps encoded and posted in there as well so that uh, you, if you want to go back and review the video afterwards and jump to specific questions, go right ahead. Oh, someone's posting here. Say, please answer the last question. Please, please. Okay. What's the last question? What's your opinion on probiotics, enzymes in terms of helping you absorb protein? I think they work very well. I use them personally. And I've been using probiotics and digestive enzymes for years. And I find that when I take them, I have less gas, less bloating, and I find that my food just digests better. It doesn't like sit in my stomach like a rock. So there, hopefully that answers your question. But I'm a big fan of, of digestive enzymes and probiotics. There. All right. Back to what I was saying earlier. <laughs> Uh, the video chat will be posted up with the replay and the timestamps and all that. So if you want to go back and review it, you certainly can. And uh, in the meantime, if you would like some help with your own workout or nutrition program, if you have any questions or challenges or you would like some feedback uh, or you would like to discuss a realistic action plan for you, send me an email. My email is leeh at leehayward.com. Just drop me a line and share whatever challenges that you have whether it's, you know, you, you want to lose weight and get in shape, maybe you want to build muscle, or maybe you're working around some specific injuries or challenges or whatnot, let me know. And if I can help you, then I'll let you know. And if I feel that I can't, then I'll try and point you in the right direction to someone who can. But bottom line, if you do have some questions or you would like some uh, help or just to chat about uh, different options, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to chat with you and see if we can come up with a realistic action plan to move you in the right direction towards your fitness and fat loss goals. All right, guys, I'm going to clue it up. Hope you enjoyed the chat. I sure did, and we'll be doing it again next week. So have yourself a great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. Over and out. Boom.